it was the middle of March. The anti-aircraft fire over France was not too heavy. Although the guns would start firing from all sides whenever some plane went off course and into a protected zone. On other occasions the night passed quietly. The bright moon peered into the cockpit of my Lancaster and it was light, almost as bright as day. The French landscape below us was vaguely visible, partially obscured by a thin layer of white clouds. It was quite hot in the cabin. I shouted to the radio operator. Hey, Hutch, turn down the heat. He replied. Well, thanks for that. The heater in the Lancaster was located somewhere near the back of the radio operator's seat, so the long-suffering Hutch did not hide his relief. All around me, above and below, I could see other Lancasters flying toward the target. They were rushing forward like giant arrows and seemed to me far more formidable and powerful than ever. I was glad that this was the last raid before a short vacation. So far, I had flown 173 sorties with almost no rest. It looked too good to be true, and after this Stuttgart raid, I'm off to Cornwall to see my wife. Once more, I shall be able to stroll down St. Ives with my pipe in my mouth and my dog nigger running beside me. Once more, I shall be able to stand on the shore, admiring the strengthening storm. In the evenings, I won't be suffocating in an oxygen mask. A cosy rocking chair and playing with my dog awaits me. No more having to plan bomber raids and think about bomb load options. The pleasant reflections were interrupted by a wild shout from the flight engineer. The left outer is dying, sir. That's right. The left outboard engine had begun to fail. I could see it myself on the instruments. The engine was no longer producing the power it needed. My heavily laden Lancaster began to lose altitude rapidly. This was bad. If we turn back now, I'd have to fly again tomorrow night. Maybe the weather would turn bad. Maybe I'd have to wait another four days for a vacation so maybe it's better to try to hold out. Scrive, my navigator, stood with his head against the ceiling, anxiously watching the speed indicator, whose arrow was going down fast. I ask, What are we to do, Scrive? It's up to you, sir. Okay, Scrive. Then we'll fly on at low altitude. I'll try to gain altitude before making a bombing run. The Lancaster slipped slowly out of the general formation and went like a wounded bird toward the ground. On all sides came alive anti-aircraft guns in Mannheim, Frankfurt, Mainz, Italy. I could see perfectly well how our guys break through the curtain of fire. But the Krauts weren't firing at me. Not even the machine guns were firing at me. Maybe they mistook me for their night fighter. High above me I could see the Lancaster in the searchlight, its wings shining brightly. I even thought I could distinguish individual airplanes in the light of the fires raging in the streets of Stuttgart. The whole city was on fire. A huge bomb whistled past me, hurtling downward. A few seconds later there was a big flash on the ground below where it had fallen. My airplane shuddered and danced like a light leaf. I remember at one point seeing a series of lighters 200 yards in front. It's really interesting to be under the bombs while piloting a heavy bomber. We dropped our load and my poor Lancaster literally bounced as the bomb fell out of its belly. I turned sharply and spun toward the ground. We hardly spoke during these tense moments. However, as we left the target area, the guys on board thawed out. Vacation tomorrow. Yeah, we'll take tomorrow off. I'm going fishing. I'm gonna get some sleep. Vacation tomorrow. My wife has been working in a war factory near London with no rest either, but now I'll be able to take her home. We can finally breathe the fresh and sweet air of Cornwall. Soon, having safely dodged the night fighters, we were over English soil. A few minutes later I flew into my room and began hurriedly stripping off my clothes to jump into bed. As I passed out I thought about vacation and the splash of the surf off the cliffs of Cornwall. The next day I was up late. My ears were still ringing and my eyes were red and watery, as if sand had been stuffed under my eyelids. I wanted to lie longer in the warm bed that was so quiet and peaceful. I wanted to take a nap to be alone. After a year of continuous fighting, I was a little tired. I thought that human endurance has its limits. No matter how much you abuse your own body, it can't take more than it can handle. Charlie's squadron adjutant walked in. Anything important? I asked sleepily. New assignment, sir? There was genuine sympathy in his voice, or he was a good actor. A new WD assignment? Where to? To Group 5 headquarters. I heard something like that before I went on leave. The group commander said that I had done quite enough, and yet the news was completely unexpected. 
and was a blow to me. Assignment to headquarters. That's all I needed. I found the phone next to the bed and called the group headquarters. Charles sat down on the corner of the bed and watched Nigger chewing diligently on one of my flip-flops on the mat in front of the fireplace. After a short talk with the chief of staff, I found out that all this was true. My squadron was to be received by John Searby, and I was to report to headquarters tomorrow afternoon. The air group commander will explain the reasons. Apparently, he wanted me to help write a manual for future bomber pilots. Write a book? I've never done anything like that in my life, and the timing was perfect. Just as the real bomber offensive began, at the very least I was willing to be base commander. At least then I'd have the job of preparing operations. But the worst part was my vacation was up. I asked Charles to send a telegram to Eve and explained what my crew should do. When I finished giving instructions, Charles nonchalantly picked up the phone and booked a large room at a local pub. In the evening we had a grand farewell party there. Wine poured down the river and many warm words were said. I stood up and gave a curt speech, glancing nervously into my glass. The other guys were quiet for a while, listening. I said that I had been in this squadron for about a year and that I was sorry to leave. I wished them luck in all the flying they would do without me. They were still listed as one of the best squadrons in Bomber Command and in my opinion, just the best. It's hard to say anything coherent in a position like mine. However, when I sat down, there were a few cheers of approval. And then the big drinking started. The next day I arrived at Grantham. Air Group Headquarters, like any other headquarters, is quite an entertaining place. It's a realm of calm, cold business. The girls of the CDUSS Yuri are scurrying back and forth with cups of tea. Tired men walk the corridors with red folders in their hands. The yellow lights above the doors of the group commander and chief of staff are almost constantly lit, showing that they are busy. Great decisions are being made here every minute. Everyone is constantly running out of time. And it cost me a lot of labor to squeeze into the hustle and bustle. I stayed there for a day or two and even tried to get serious about working on the manual, but the group commander sent for me. Air Vice Marshal Corriton left, which was deeply regretted by all the personnel of the group. His place was taken by Air Vice Marshal the Honorable Ralph Cochrane. He was a very intelligent man with outstanding organizational skills. He immediately congratulated me on my buckle to the Distinguished Service Order, and then, without taking a breath, how would you feel about making another flight? I shuddered. Again anti-aircraft fire, again fighters, but still found the strength to clarify love. What kind of flight, sir? A very important one. Perhaps one of the most devastating of the entire war. I can't say more than that yet. Do you want to take it on? I said I might, only I'd have to remember where I'd ditched my flight jumpsuit. Cochrane remarked that there was no need for such a rush, and I calmed down, as flying tonight was clearly not required. But two more days passed, and nothing happened. On the third day they sent for me again. In Cochrane's office was another man, one of the youngest base commanders, Air Commodore Charles Whitworth. The vice marshal was very friendly. He motioned for me to sit down, offered me a cigar, and began a conversation. Recently I asked you if you would be willing to participate in one raid. You agreed, but I warned you that it would be an unusual operation. In fact, it won't be for another two months at the earliest. I thought, devil, it's the tippets. And what for the sake of which I agreed? Moreover, the preparation of this raid is becoming so important that the Commander-in-Chief has decided to form a separate squadron, especially for the sake of it. As you know, I trust you, so I've decided that you will be the one to form it. I think you'd be better off using Whitworth's base at Scampton. As for crews, it's best if you select your own. Lieutenant Colonel Smith will help select the ground personnel. Each squadron will give you the men you request. You should hurry, however as you will not get too much time for training. They are of exceptional importance, so get to them immediately. Remember that you will be bound by a tight deadline and I expect you to start flying in as little as four days. Go upstairs and give the names of the pilots to Cartwright. He'll help you call up anyone you require. But what kind of training, sir, and what kind of targeting? I can't. I'm afraid I can't say more than that at the moment. All you have to do for now is to pick up the crews and get them ready to fly. Then we'll meet and I'll tell you the rest. How are the planes and equipment? The group engineer Major may will do whatever it takes. Goodbye, Gibson. And he returned abruptly to his work.
That was the signal for me. There was a big raid planned for the evening, and it had to be prepared. As I was about to close the door, he threw me a backhanded glance. Let me know when you're ready. And remember, don't say a word to anyone. This is just a regular new squadron. The strictest secrecy is required. Already in the corridor, Charles said to me, I'll see you in Scampton. If you stick around for a couple days, I'll have time to get everything ready for you. How many guys are you going to bring? About 700. I was left alone in a completely disheveled state of mind. Charles went to Scampton, and I started up the stairs to meet the people who had a decisive influence on the life of the Royal Air Force, although the general public knew nothing about them. These people were mostly too old to fly, so they dealt with matters of equipment, armament, personnel, and so on. The first one I met had a puffy red moustache and sat behind a huge disc. This was Cartwright, in charge of flight staff affairs. He gave me an hour to pick out pilot candidates. I wrote out the names on a piece of paper and handed it to him. I selected these men myself based on personal acquaintance. I believed they were the best pilots in bomber aviation. All of them had already completed their operational cycle and were about to receive their long-awaited vacations. But I was also well aware that none of them would be willing to rest if they missed a unique operation in doing so. Cartwright helped me pick the crews because I didn't know the others as well as the pilots. However, we chose very carefully and again selected the best. I think he was a little perplexed by the urgency of the assignment and my desire to have only the very, very best. I then went to another office, the group engineer's office. I needed ten serviceable airplanes to start with. The rest I was to get a little later. This turned out to be hard works. Spare wheels, tyres, starters, motors, and so on ad infinitum had to be pieced together. Good thing, too, that Cartwright relieved me of my worries about the flight crew, promising to send all the selected people to Scampton as early as tomorrow. Such is where things were handled here. Flight suits, cars, bunks, blankets, typewriters, even beer. All this hassle took up a whole day. The next morning I went to the personnel office to deal with ground personnel. We talked to all the squadrons. I needed the most experienced mechanics, gunners, technicians, and I got then, together with a representative of the Women's Auxiliary Corps, we selected drivers and cooks, which, by the way, is also extremely important. After that, things got out of my control. I got myself a daily planner where I wrote down my tasks for each day, and each time I got an impressive column. When I did something, I crossed out that line, but by the end of the day, the list was almost as long. Then I had to go to the Chief of Staff, who replaced the commander. This was Air Commodore Harry Satterley, a big, fat man who had a habit of solving problems the moment they arose. His help cannot be overemphasized. I don't even know if I would have managed without him. This is how I managed to form a squadron in two days. It had no name or number yet. We acted too quickly for the relevant department of the ministry to swing and allocate us numbers and letters, so we decided to call ourselves Squadron X for the time being. Full personnel arrived at Scampton the next morning, and training began in the afternoon. The group commander said we wouldn't get much time, so we started immediately, but we had hard work ahead of us. Meanwhile, somewhere in London, other people were working even harder. They, too, were in a terrible hurry. They didn't wear uniforms, and they didn't have awards. They worked with blueprints, metal and explosives in concrete bunkers. Occasionally, they would appear on the windswept hills of Wales to conduct their high-profile experiments. And then it was back to work, 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 work. The next evening I arrived at Scampton with Nigger, who was bouncing merrily along trying to catch my heels. In the dining room I smelled the distinctive odour of a party. It was. All the guys were gathered in the hall. I knew them all, pilots, navigators, bombardiers, but there were a few unfamiliar gunners and radio operators. In a few seconds I had a glass of whiskey in my hand and a beer splashed on the floor for Nigger, who was obviously thirsty. And then a conversation ensued in which we reminisced about matters of bygone days. Men, raids, bases, bombs. It was the kind of conversation that only pilots can have, but not movie pilots. They were lively, cheerful guys who had been through a lot. This was immediately evident on their faces. However, they were ready for new challenges because they were the best aces of bomber com Altogether, they knew more about the art of bombing than any other squadron in the world from all over the world. Australia, America, Canada, New Zealand, Great Britain, all were obsessed with one idea, not to let the enemy out of the steel grip. 
I stood next to them, sipped my beer, and was proud of them. They were the best team in the world. If someone says it wasn't E, I'll just laugh at them. Three crews arrived from a 106 squadron. Hoppy, of course, and an Australian Dave Shannon. The third was a Canadian Sergeant Burpee. He had just married a young Englishwoman and was busy trying to find a cabin not too far from the airfield. He told me it was a hell of a task. Someone else was due to arrive, but as mentioned, it was the best of the best. From the Middle East, Melvin Young, a dinghy wing commander, arrived. He had already flown 65 combat sorties. Dingy had two forced landings in the azure waves of the Mediterranean Sea. He was an excellent organiser. I later discovered that he could drink a pint of beer faster than anyone. His Munro of 97 Squadron was born in New Zealand. He was a thoroughly charming fellow with a fine service record. He was one of those people you could always count on. The kind that always does the right thing at the right time. While he was standing around, paying his respects and drinking a beer. There was also a great pilot. Brooklyn gave me Joe McCarthy. He was the kind of American who enlisted as a volunteer in the Royal Air Force before America entered the war. He was later given the chance to return to the American Air Force, but preferred to stay with old acquaintances. He came from the same squadron as Les, and they were die-hard buddies. Joe had tried to get into my squadron before, but all his attempts had failed. But now he was happy. We sat up until midnight, filling our glasses every now and then to toast the accomplishments of X squadron portraits of Victoria Cross recipients. Babe Leroyd and Sergeant John Hanna stared back at us from the wall. These two men flew from Skempton Airfield and received many honours, including top honours. Henry Model came from Ayton. He was the school's champion runner and became one of the best pilots in 50 Squadron. He stood quiet and sober, for the most part refusing to drink. Henry later became one of my main helpers in organising training. There were others here as well. Mickey Martin was born in Australia, as was his buddy Jack Lego, a fine navigator, Bob Hay, Toby Foxley, Lem Knight, Len Chambers were all Australians too. They all had distinguished flying crosses and all were very pleased with themselves. My own crew played with nigger. Then Terry, Spam, Trevor and Hutch went to bed, which should have been done a long time ago. Nigger knocked over four full mugs, leaving a long winding stream behind him in the hallway he too retired to rest. The party dragged on, and Charles Whitworth joined us, along with his deputy Briggy. They attempted to organise a dignified meeting for us, and they succeeded completely. It would soon become clear to even a casual observer that this was an unusual squadron. The regulars in the mess hall began to look at us with curiosity. They had never before seen such company gathered in one squadron. Many had two distinguished flying crosses, almost all had one, and some had the distinguished service order. I'm sure everyone began to wonder, what's going on here? Immediately the most incredible rumours began to spread. Have you heard that a new select squadron is being formed? They're going to Russia. No, to North Africa. Something special. Yes, very special. The boys were noticing this. They felt a sense of wonder and interest. They were proud to be in a special squadron, but they still wanted to know why. Finally, Canadian Coles asked me the fateful question. It was very late, but I remember my answer very well. I know less than you old men. But we will meet tomorrow at 9.30, and then something will become clear. The next day I got everyone together. In all I had 21 crews or 147 men. Pilots, navigators, radio operators, flight engineers. Almost all of them were veterans. I remembered this briefing room from 1939, but now it was packed with young carefree guys who were eager to find out what was going on. I seemed like a real old man among them. My speech was short. I said, you are here on a special mission. You are a select squadron, and you are to conduct a raid which I am told will be of great importance. Some say it will even bring the war closer to an end. That's all I can say. I don't know where it is. I don't know what it is. But what I do know is that we're going to have to exercise day and night, flying at low altitude, so you can fly the airplane even blindfolded. If I tell you to find a certain tree in the middle of England, that means you are to bomb that particular tree and no other. If I tell you to fly through a hangar, you will have to do it even if your wings won't fit through the gate. Discipline will be of the strictest. I don't need to remind you that you are not authorised to talk about anything. To have the best pilots in one squadron is unusual in itself. There will be more than enough rumours. 
Some I've already heard. We must stop it. You mustn't say anything. When you go to the pub in the evening, keep your mouth shut. If the other pilots ask you what you're doing, tell them to mind their own business. Only secrecy will ensure the success of the operation. I'll need a couple more days to finalize preparations, and I need your help. Most of you have been in the service and know exactly what's required. First of all, we need to test our new planes. Then you, Bill, should take your crew and check out every lake in England, Scotland and Wales that you can find. You must photograph them. I should have those pictures in 36 hours. This morning the team commander on the phone ordered me to get on it. Why it was necessary, I didn't understand. The guys apparently didn't understand either. Then I continue. So let's not jump to conclusions. The group commander wants training cards for his retraining teams, and we're the only squadron so far that can help him. That was the first batch of lies I had to let out. I said a lot of other things later. I don't remember them all. Something about discipline in general, about flight discipline, about working hours and layoffs. Oh yes, no layoffs. Then I, along with Henry and Melvin, started dividing the crews up into sections. They picked people they knew. People got rooms and offices, and I went upstairs. My own office had one chair, one desk, one telephone, nothing else. The room was empty and cold, because the hangar heating hadn't been turned on yet, but I couldn't pay attention to that. There was still a lot of work to be done. I used to have an adjutant, Humphrey, who relieved me of the paperwork. He'd been a clerk in peacetime and had gone up the ranks in the war. Humphrey really wanted to fly, but he was too short-sighted. But he was young and smart. I needed just such a man now, so I called the group headquarters and asked them to send me Humphrey within 48 hours. But for the next few days I was to be without an adjutant, and the work of forming the new squadron fell on the strong shoulders of three men whom I must mention separately. The very first was Staff Sergeant Powell, who became Petty Officer of the squadron. He interviewed all the airmen, assigned them bunks and lockers, kept order, and supervised the unloading of all sorts of property. Chief I. Powell was a short jumper, who did not resemble the hard-headed petty officers of the old days. He turned out to be a good psychoanalyst and treated people very politely, able to find the best in a person, although Powell himself did not realize it. It was he who laid the foundations of a healthy atmosphere that later served us well. He was a great little man, a king in his own way. The second was Sergeant Hebron, who was in charge of the office. The group headquarters kept their promise, and we received everything we needed to equip the planes and pilots. However, they forgot to provide us with typewriters and stationery, as well as clerks. So Hebron had to beg, borrow, and sometimes steal everything needed to run the bureaucratic machine. We already had to issue orders and conduct correspondence. Since Hebron was the only one who knew how to use a typewriter, he had to work for 18 hours filling out various forms, drafting documents, and typing orders. Sometimes he would ask me to spare someone to help, but what could I do? The third was a woman from the auxiliary. I didn't even remember her last name, but I remember her name was Mary. She was the kind of woman who makes a great wife. She found out about our problems and transferred to us from one of the neighboring airfields to help with the paperwork. If all this had happened in the civilian world, she could have charged a lot for overtime. So this trio got down to business, turning the crowd into a squadron and I sat in my office, amazed at the flurry of activity swarming around me. For the first two days, Jack Lego and Bob Hay had been busy selecting flight charts, setting up bomb sites and checking bomb throwers. They already knew that bombing would be one of our main activities for the next two months. The Link commanders were getting their units in order. They faced numerous problems that there is simply no way to describe. There were no parachutes, no life jackets, no compass keys but it was to be hoped to get the squadron up to speed in just two days. The girl kept typing. Shifai was dealing with the men. The ground staff was swarming like ants around the new planes. The Air Ministry finally deigned to realize the fact that a new squadron had been formed and assigned us a number. We became 617 Squadron. We received the letters AJ as our identifying marks. They immediately put them on the fuselages of the bombers. I got to know all the crews little by little. The pilots introduced their men to me. In a short conversation, I tried to find out who was what. Then the crew would leave my office and the next one would appear, and so on. But there were a few people I had to turn down, even though it didn't denigrate them in any way. There were other problems. Group headquarters ordered squadrons to send to my disposal the best people, 
but some of the commanders took the opportunity to get rid of junk. For example, from my own 106th squadron arrived two people who I was still trying to get rid of, so I sent them back and asked Charles, the adjutant of the 106th, to explain what I thought about it. From other squadrons, two pregnant women from the auxiliary were sent to me, who were of no use anyway. Someone else tried little tricks that I just hate to mention. But by the third day, everything was ready to go. We could start training, and the whole squadron was convinced of that. In one of the big hangars, Chief I. Powell assembled all the ground staff, and I climbed on the roof of my Humber car and made a little speech to them. I said roughly the same thing I had said to the pilots, emphasizing the need for the strictest secrecy. There could be no chatter. Charles Whitworth then arrived and officially congratulated the 617th Squadron. He gave an excellent speech which I would like to memorize so that I can use it myself on appropriate occasions. However, in the intervening time, I have managed to forget almost everything. He said, Many of you have seen Noel Coward's movie where we serve. Coward, who plays a destroyer commander, asks one of the sailors what is the secret to a great ship, and the sailor reply, That's what I want you to be happy here. I firmly promise you one thing. If you don't set me up, I won't set you up anywhere ever. In the afternoon, Humphrey finally arrived, and together we made the first report of the exercise. It was brief for little had been done. The squadron was formed on 20.3.43. Everything necessary for training was received only on 25.3.43. During this period, several training flights at low altitude conducted. The squadron was split into two units on 22.3.343. However, the starter batteries and tools arrived only on 26.3.43. There are no parachutes, but a few were borrowed from the 57th squadron. Still no life jackets, but our pilots pay no attention to this when flying over the sea. Most assume that we fly so low that there is nothing to worry about at all. All airplanes are in good working order. Full training will begin tomorrow. The crews are manned. And we started training. First of all, there was a meeting in my office. It wasn't so bare anymore. Someone had brought in and carpeted it. Dingy, Henry, Jack Lego and Bob Hay sat in chairs. The group commander has ordered me to continue this nonsense at low altitude. We're going to have to limit the altitude to 150 feet first, because I don't want the guys knocking down all the trees around here. We'll do 10 standard routes to save the surveillance service a lot of work. I suggest you think about which part of the country is best for further training. Any route is suitable, but the duration of the flight should not exceed three hours. We will have enough work in the first days. We must learn to fly both day and night. The guys have to practice flying by moonlight. That goes for the rest of us, too. The navigators have to keep a pad during the flight, and then we'll see how they do. I asked Jack if he had any problems. The navigator replied that there were. We discussed a few things. First of all, there was a persistent problem with the charts. When you fly at low altitude above the ground, the terrain flashes below. A large-scale map is required, and navigators have to change sheets all the time. It was decided to use roll maps but we had to make them ourselves. Jack said he would make each navigator take care of his own maps. He then went on to the problems of flying at low altitudes. Jack said, If you intend to fly a long distance at low altitude, over Germany or anywhere else, it doesn't matter. We shouldn't expect any help from radio beacons. Therefore, I propose to emphasize map flying. I propose to teach the bombardiers to read the map. The navigator keeps an eye on the map, while the bombardier and radio operator keep watch. In this case, landmarks will be sought by eight pairs of eyes, so we can expect things to go smoothly. I agreed to these and many of his other suggestions. I then suggested that Dinyi supervise the training while I flew south. On the way, I motored over to Grantham to meet with the group's chief of staff. He said to me, I am sending you south to meet a scientist who is working on our project. He will show you almost everything. However, remember that only the group commander, myself and four others, know about this project. You will be the seventh. I need not repeat that the strictest secrecy is mandatory. And we set off. The traffic on the highway was not too busy. Only a few large army columns passed us to the north. We passed London and arrived at an old railroad station somewhere in a remote province. The command was so secret that even my chauffeur was not supposed to know exactly where I was going. Half an hour later, I was met by a tall man whom I will call Matt. He was a senior test pilot for a well-known firm, 
and had personally tested prototypes of several of our best bombers. We drove on in his tiny Fiat without saying a word. I didn't expect to see such a young man, I didn't expect to see a civilian, but I imagine he was as surprised as I was. At last we arrived at the old farmhouse. Here our passes were checked and rechecked, and I had to pull out a special pass numbered seven, which had been given to me only this morning by the chief of staff of the air group. Only then did a couple of burly policemen let us inside. We walked down a long, poorly lit corridor, down some stairs, deep into the bowels of the earth. At last we came to a large steel door. Two more sentries stood here, and the procedure of checking the passes was repeated. These guards were as vigilant as the ones upstairs. Then one of them opened a steel door, and we entered the science laboratory. Here the light was much brighter than in the dark corridor, and it took me a long time to blink. And here I met a man I won't describe in detail, because I know he doesn't like it. I'll call him Jeff, though of course that's not his real name. He was a scientist, a famous aircraft designer. Jeff was neither too young nor too old. He was a quiet, serious man who worked long and hard. He was one of those key figures that will only be told about after the war. Jeff looked us over carefully and only then said, It's good to see you, but I don't suppose you know why you've come. Not the slightest idea. The group's chief of staff said you'd let me know everything I needed to know. His eyebrows crept upward. So you have no idea what your objective is? Not a clue. This is inconvenient, too inconvenient. But the chief of staff? I know, but only a few people know everything. Their names are on this list, he waved a piece of paper. As I could tell, the list was more than short. That's pretty damn stupid, Matt remarked. I know, but I can't help you. I'll tell you everything I can. Hopefully the team leader will let you know the rest when you get back. I said he was perfectly right, and intrigued, prepared to listen. Jeff continued. There are several facilities in enemy territory that are extremely vulnerable to air attack. They are of exceptional military importance. However, to destroy them requires dropping large quantities of explosives directly on them. You know what I'm talking about. For example, viaducts, submarine bunkers, large ships and the like. I studied this problem for a long time, but always the difficulties remained big too big. First of all, there was no airplane with sufficient payload and high speed. Then the Lancaster came along, and that problem was solved. Then there was the problem of the explosive itself. You can put it either in a very large bomb or a very large mine, but it must also be dropped accurately enough. The deviation must not exceed a few meters. There are three difficulties here. To achieve such accuracy, the attack must be carried out from a very low altitude, that is, less than 300 feet. But large bombs have a bad habit of exploding as they fall, and what this can lead to, you can easily imagine. If you increase the altitude, the accuracy decreases and the job is a failure. It's a vicious circle. The other two problems are well known to you. These are anti-aircraft guns and barrage balloons, which are especially dangerous at low altitudes. And last of all, low-altitude flight over water. Over water? I interrogated. Yes, over water, at night or early in the morning, when the water surface will be as smooth as a mirror, but at the same time there is a rather thick fog over it. I began to think of possible targets. Tirpitz, submarine bunkers. Jeff, however, continued. We have another month or two to get over these difficulties, so we'll have to work hard. Matt and I are working on a new mine. The idea is very simple, but I won't talk about it yet. Come, I'll show you. The lights in the lab went out, and a small screen came on, on which an image taken by an amateur camera twitched. The titters were menacing. Top secret tests. Experiment no. One, then an airplane appeared, descending rapidly toward the water, flying over some river. When it was 200 feet high, a strange cylindrical object separated from it and flew slowly toward the water. I was surprised. At first I thought the airplane was going to be blown to pieces by an explosion, but there was only a huge splash, and then it became clear how that device worked. But I'm not at liberty to talk about it. The airplane drifted away. More test footage followed. Jeff and Matt gave some explanations, but I thought everything worked fine. Then the screen went white again and the lights came back on in the room. Yes. You see, the special mine can handle these problems, and it works. But it's only a quarter life-size model after all. I fear we'll run into a host of difficulties when we move on to real mines. Have any real ones been made? I interrupted. Not yet. 
no. The first one will be ready in about a week, and at the same time the Lancaster will be modernized to carry it. The Avro firm has a tremendous amount of work to do to modify the planes. I imagine they're working around the clock. Now I want to know something from you. Will you be able to keep up with the required flight pattern? That means a speed of 240 miles an hour and an altitude of 150 feet above the water after a dive from 2,000 feet. At the same time, the bomb must be dropped with an accuracy of a few yards. I said it's a little tricky, but it's worth a try. I'll let him know as soon as something is clear. Then I move back, out of that strange cabin and into the open air. Matt dropped me off at the station, and four hours later I was back in Scampton. The boys were in the air, so I picked up Nigger and went for a walk and thought. A walk is the best way to think through a complex problem, but the longer we walked, the more it seemed to me that the problem was unsolvable. Nigger, on the other hand, was perfectly happy. He was chasing rabbits. The next day I had another meeting. I told the guys about the marksmanship and flight mode requirements, but I didn't say a word about the weapons I'd seen. And then the arguments began. Dingy was the first to speak. The first big snare is that we'll have to practice flying by moonlight. I assume there will be moonlight or twilight. I said I assumed it would be either. Good, then I'll remind you of the peculiarities of this country. Here the moon is always dim, and in addition the weather is almost always bad, so we will not get good practice. We are required to invent some kind of simulator for night flying. Didn't the chief of staff tell you about flying with darkened cockpit windows? Henry asked. Yes, I've tried that, but it doesn't work too well. You can't see the instruments. But I've heard that the auxiliary aviation has invented a way to simulate night flying. The cockpit windows are painted blue and the entire crew wears yellow goggles. It's extra colors or something like that, but the result is a moonlit effect, whereas it's a sunny day outside. That sounds curious. Go have a word with the group's chief of staff. Maybe we can get a hold of that too? He popped out for a few minutes, then returned. Had a word. This thing is being used at the Ford base. He says we'll get priority right away, and we'll have three planes brought in as soon as the crews are found. He'll call us back when it's all sorted out. Jack Lego then touched again on the problems of navigation. How should routes be chosen? Whether canals and lakes could be used which would make the navigator's work much easier? Could an extra bombardier be taken as an eighth crew member to give him extra practice? They already fly eight hours a day, which is plenty for pilots. Then Bob Hay stood up. We don't have training bombers, and how is he supposed to organize a bombing run? No floating squibs, which is important when flying over water. What kind of targets do we need to set up at the range? Can we have this range to ourselves all day long? All of these problems were quickly resolved by the chief of staff. Apparently he ate, slept, and lived in his office. He did everything. Trevor had his own problems. He wanted to train his riflemen. If we were going to attack from low altitude, he wanted to be able to return fire. For that, he needed tracer bullets. Although the Lancaster was armed with only 7.7mm machine guns, tracer rounds might seem like cannon bursts to anti-aircraft gunners. Getting tracer ammunition was very difficult, but the chief of staff managed that. Hatch was more concerned with general problems. He had little idea what his radio operators would do. It's all right, Hutch. Take care of the regular training of the radio operators, get them better trained, and your turn will come later. Now a few general remarks, big boys. I've been talking to the mechanics and they report that several planes have already come back with branches and leaves in their radiators. That means the boys are flying too low. Stop it or someone will get killed. I should also add that there have been several complaints from constables. Airplanes are flying very low and scaring people. We all know that we need to practice flying at low altitude but for God's sake, try to impress upon your boys that they should avoid flying over cities and airfields. You don't want to scare policemen on the roads or lovers in the fields or they might have a heart attack. Now if you'll excuse me, I have to fly to one reservoir myself to see what we can do. Half an hour later I was flying my trusty G. George to a reservoir on the river Dewent near Sheffield. This lake is surrounded by high hills and enough industrial fumes gather over it that we were quite happy with it. What's more, the water was almost always calm as there was hardly any wind in the valley. Remembering what Jeff had told me, we began to dive to gain the proper speed at 150 feet as far as we could tell. After that we dropped the bomb. It came down short. After that we twisted and spun following the curves of the valley as the hills loomed up on each side. 
Then we made several more attempts, and finally found that the requirements could be met. In the evening, as fog began to gather in the valley, reducing visibility to about a mile, we made a second attempt. This time we had no success. The water, which had been blue during the day, now seemed black, and we almost fell into that blackness. Even spam said, Jesus, it's fucking dangerous, so it was really dangerous, but not as I told Dingy that until we learned to estimate our flying altitude over the water, we just wouldn't be able to mount an attack on principle. But why do we have to fly at exactly that altitude? Poppy asked. I fear there's a catch here. A scientist I met with told me that in order for the weapon to work, you have to fly at an altitude accurate to a couple of feet and a speed of a couple of miles an hour. So much for the challenge. The next day the air group commander sent for me. When I entered his office I saw three large parcel boxes on the floor. He handed me a screwdriver. When you see what these are, it won't be too hard to guess, although I'm not going to tell you where they are. Jeff called me and told me you can't prepare the squadron for the unknown. Still, he'll give the final details. However, let me remind you that you remain the only person in the squadron who is allowed to know the target well in advance of the day of the attack. Now open these boxes. They were all carefully nailed shut, with fragile cargo written on the top. Since I am not a carpenter, it took me quite a while. Finally, the screws gave way. We lifted the heavy lids together. In front of us were three models that had been exceptionally carefully crafted. There were even tiny trees. At first I was relieved, thank God it wasn't a tirpitz. However, this was something unexpected. Three dams, very large dikes. Then the group commander said, Now you have seen what you are to attack. Take an airplane and fly to meet the right man. When you return, report back. Professor Jeff was in his office. I thought he even seemed pleased to see me. How's training going? He asked. I told him that it was okay during the day, but much worse at night. Standing 150 feet above the water was proving almost impossible. But you think you'll be able to achieve it? Yes. Good. Now let's get to work. Matt, did you grab my downward file? What is it? I inquired. It's the code name for the operation you're facing. The air group commander informed me that he showed you the targets. It was hard for me to make sense of my feelings, since I didn't know where these causeways were. Cochrane had talked about fog and industrial fumes, so it was an urban area where it wasn't too hot. Matt handed me a cigarette. Jeff opened the folder and began. The dams whose models you saw are on reservoirs in the Ra Valley. The weapon you saw in my lab is called the Downwood. I think that by using the invented weapons properly, we will be able to destroy the concrete walls of those three dams. But can't smaller bombs do that? Jeff laughed. No. A lot of people think they can. They think a dike is just a curved surface that holds water in, like the arch of a bridge. There are dams like that, but in our case it's a little different. These leaves are supposed to hold water with their weight. They are 140 feet thick of concrete and brick and 150 feet high, so you can easily imagine the sheer volume of masonry that would have to be demolished to bring them down. But let's start at the beginning. I prepared myself to listen attentively. As you know, the Ruha Valley is the most industrialized area of Germany, mainly because of its coal mines and steel mills. I know that most of Germany's factories are now scattered around the country, but it is simply impossible to move heavy industry plants. So the Ruhr Valley is still an important target, even if your guys would do anything to tear down every house there. However, the industry of the Ruhr has a vulnerable spot to water supply. The Ruhr River itself is too small to supply enough water. The Rhine is too far away from cities like Essen and Dortmund. So in 1911, the Germans built a huge dam blocking off the Mon Valley through which the Ruhr River flows. The main idea was to try to create a water reserve by collecting what fell in the Ruhr Basin during the winter rains. This reserve could then be gradually drawn down in the summer to maintain the river's water level in supply cities and industries. Before the dam was built, the water supply was highly irregular. In addition, the dam improves navigation conditions in the lower reaches of the Ruhr and provides water for the hydroelectric power plant. Needless to say, the Germans are very proud of this dam. Besides, it looks very beautiful, an example of Gothic architecture. The dam is 850 yards long, 140 feet thick and 150 feet high. 
The resulting lake is about 12 miles long and contains 140 million tons of water. At the same time, the Germans built another dam not far away, called Zorp. It is much smaller and is a high earthen rampart about 600 yards long with a concrete frame. These dams hold back about 76% of the water available in the Ruhr Valley. If they were to collapse, water shortages for people and factories could be catastrophic. Of course, the flooding that would ensue after the dams are destroyed could bring more destruction than the heaviest bombardment. There is also a third dam called Edda. It is 60 miles from the first two. It was built in 1914 mainly to save agricultural areas in the lower reaches of the Weser River from winter floods and to improve navigation conditions there. The dam also supplies some water to the Mitterland Canal, which, as you know, is one of Germany's main waterways. It is the main waterway from the Ruhr to Berlin. Unlike the Mon Dam, the Eder Dam is not designed to improve the water supply. It does, however, feed a hydroelectric power plant. It is slightly larger than the Monet Dam and is located in a valley 40 miles from Kassel. It contains about 202 million tonnes of water. You can imagine how long we try to invent a method of breaking down the dam walls. It's not as easy as it sounds. If we here consider ourselves perfectly safe from high explosive bombs sitting behind three feet of concrete, you must understand what I meant when I said we had to demolish 150 feet of masonry. I nodded. I think I understood. We've done experiments trying to figure out the effects of explosives on structures like this. Now I'm going to show you something. He opened an album with pictures of a small dam, no more than six feet wide, that had been blown apart by several explosive charges. This is what we got. Our next experiment was to try to test all the theories on a larger dam. We built a dam about 200 feet long in the garden. This dam was a perfectly exact copy of the Mons Dam. The lake was filled with water. By selecting different charges, we tried to find out if our theory was true. I found the whole thing funny. I remembered my childhood. My mates and I used to play on the beaches of Cornwall, and we liked to build sand dikes across the streams running down the granite cliffs. We would make quite large pools behind the sand barriers, and when we were called for lunch, I would destroy the whole structure with one swing of a stick, and the water would rush gurglingly to the sea. I also remembered how angry my brother had gotten when he saw what I had done. And what happened? I asked. What needed to happen? After a few experiments, we managed to set the charge in the right place, and it worked like the bomb the Lancaster would carry. The dam cracked. It split all the way to the bottom. After a few more charges were detonated, the dam collapsed and water rushed into the garden. But that's not enough. We have not yet conducted full-scale experiments. We learned that Midland County Council had built a dam to supply water to the town. We wrote to them and I asked for permission to blow up their old dam so that water could fill the new reservoir. After a little hesitation, they gave us permission to do so. After several failures, we managed to destroy it. Here are the pictures. I peered over his shoulder. The dam had been breached all the way to the bottom. The gap was about three feet wide. There was a dead frog lying on a pile of dirt at the bottom. After this experiment, we had a more or less accurate idea of what we were capable of. Then we had to find a suitable weapon. You have already seen it, but we weren't finished yet. He was silent for a moment and added, We haven't finished quite a bit. The smaller models of my weapons are operational, but we haven't had a chance to test the larger samples. They're not ready yet, but I think they'll be available in a few days, so we've scheduled the tests for April 16th. If the large sample works, Avro will rebuild 25 Lancasters to carry them. It's a pretty big job, because the mines weigh a lot and are about 11 feet in diameter. And then there's the time factor. The Ordnance Factory has to make the mines, and you have to learn a special method of dropping them, all of which must be completed within a month. Why is that? I asked. Because the dams should only be attacked when the reservoir is full of water. Every day a scout plane surveys these dams, and we watch the water rise. Right now it's 12 feet from the crest of the dam, and we can only strike when it's 4 feet. At that point there will be maximum water in the reservoir, and at the same time a wall only 4 feet high that you have to hit. I calculate that the desired water level will set somewhere around May 1319. That means we have about 6 weeks. It happens to be a full moon period, so the attack should be done at night or early morning. You won't be venturing into the Ruar Valley during the day, will you? God, of course not. Then the moon will help you. But if you need more light, you'll have to attack in the morning. 
That's for you to decide, though. But to make you understand better, I'll tell you a little more about the dikes. Your mines are designed so that when they touch a dike, they'll sink 40 feet deep. If they don't hit the dike, all is useless. The mine is then detonated by a hydrostate. I calculated that everything would happen as it did on the models. By detonating several mines in one place, you can move the wall backwards so that it topples over. It's water pressure, of course. The zerp arm will require a different method, but we'll deal with that later. So those are our three objectives. Yes. However, how did you come up with the theory of destroying all these things? Matt, tell him. I'm already hoarse. Okay, Matt agreed, awakening to life. Jeff had always been interested in this sort of thing, ever since he was a kid. He just remembered playing in the garden as a child. And childish play would lead to such disastrous results. It will. I know the Prime Minister is very interested in it. You mention special attacks. Yes. The very first thing you will be required to do is to get there. These mines are very heavy, and you will have to take a lot of gasoline as the flight may take a long time, so you won't be able to fly at high altitudes. But again, this is up to you. The mine should be dropped from an altitude of 150 feet plus or minus one foot, and that's going to be very difficult. At the same time, you will have to watch your speed. As soon as you get down into the valley, you'll start accelerating, and on top of everything else, you're going to have to aim as best you can. It looks very difficult. Over black water, at a constant altitude, when you won't be able to distinguish anything. Oh dear. And remember, you'll have to drop the mine just before the dam, so a normal bomb site won't work. If you underflight it, nothing will happen at all. If you overflight, the mine will fly over the crest of the dam. You have to drop it second to second. The mine will hit the parapet and explode right under the plane. It'll be a bit of a nuisance. And when is it safe to leave? It's about a hundred yards behind the dam. It'll be all right then. In an underwater explosion, the shock wave isn't too strong. And besides, you'll be protected by the parapet. I see, I said slowly. I did not see. I was completely and entirely confused. The restrictions imposed were almost impossible to fulfill. But it was still worth a try. Jeff suggested I come to the trials on April 16, so I had two more weeks to practice. Half an hour later, a puzzled aviation lieutenant colonel and a hungry dog were on a connecting plane back to Grantham. Perhaps bewildered is more accurate than bewildered. The next few days flew by. The training planes arrived to simulate night flying. We all rushed out to try it, and it turned out to be great. It was very funny to fly in the daytime convincing yourself that it was nighttime. Some of us even started yawning in earnest. The guys continued to perfect the art of piloting, and I began to puzzle over choosing a route that resembled the one we would follow over Germany. This meant flying over a lot of lakes, but there was an excellent explanation. Lakes serve as excellent landmarks and help navigators check their calculations. Since we would be flying over Germany literally over the trees, it would be necessary to maintain a very precise route. This meant increased demands on the navigator. It couldn't do without accidents. A few birds smashed through cabin windows or got into engine radiators. Some cut down the top of a tree, some dunked their belly in the water. Many times flying over the sea, our boys came under fire from His Majesty's ships. Those constantly muffed, but never once missed an opportunity to practice. To this Mickey Martin philosophically remarked, it's good practice, too. It gives you an idea of anti-aircraft fire. I felt sorry for my own crew. I was busy all day, and we could only practice toward evening or at night. Many times we took off at 6 p.m., flying along the west coast of England to the northern tip of Scotland. The funny thing about this island of ours. A lot of people for some reason think it's awfully small, and we're bunched up literally on a patch of land. In reality, however, it looks almost uninhabited. Flying over the Hebrides, we could see no sign of human habitation for miles around. These protracted solo flights took place every night. We were the lead airplane and therefore had to fly the best. Oddly enough, the guys loved it. I once heard Trevor say, It's a good thing flying with a lieutenant colonel. He keeps us awake. One day a lieutenant colonel from the Department of Aeronautics came to see me. I was sitting alone in my office when he came in and immediately started talking about the difficulties of targeting the Eder and my own dams. The new anti-submarine bomb site would be unsuitable, he explained. For special attacks, my head... What the fuck told you that? 
I asked extremely rudely. He began to explain. He was an expert on sightings, and he had been privy to the secret so he could help us. No one else knew. I calmed down. Together we managed to come up with something, although the idea was his. He took a piece of paper and drew some converging lines and then explained what it was. It was a variant of a primitive sight, resembling an obsolete rangefinder. We determined from the photographs that there were two towers on the causeway, with exactly 600 feet between them. Our minds were to be dropped at a very specific distance from the dam. He calculated everything, as he was an excellent mathematician. Then he brought in a corporal with a jigsaw, and in half an hour the prototype site was ready. It cost a little cheaper than a postcard. That same day we took to the air and I tried out the new site on a dam near Sheffield. It worked. The lieutenant colonel was very pleased that he had been able to help us and flew back to London satisfied. Another one of the behind-the-scenes figures. What was his name? Done. I was pleased too, and ordered Bob Hay, along with the bombardiers, to get busy making sites according to the proposed pattern. From that day on, the rumble of exploding training bombs rang out constantly at our range in Wainfleet. We soon achieved unheard of marksmanship. Staff Sergeant Clifford dropped eight training bombs from an altitude of 150 feet, with an average deflection of four yards. In the evening, he was supplied with three mugs of beer. The next day, Lee's knight achieved a deflection of three yards. He too was offered a drink, however he declined. We soon moved on to night practice, and again it proved to be much more difficult. Although we could clearly see the targets, we could not see the water. It was quite impossible to maintain an altitude of 150 feet. Some flew too low, scraping the belly of the airplane on the water. Others were flying too high. After the second night bombing sortie, Dingy sat down, wet as a mouse. It's all useless. I just don't see how we can accomplish it. I had to agree. Why not use electric altimeters? Ours determine altitude to an accuracy of 50 feet. Personally, I don't see the need to keep it accurate to a foot. We can easily keep plus or minus 10 feet. Why do we need two feet? Nelvin, like the rest of the guys, didn't know the purpose of the operation. I mumbled something about submarine bunkers or the tear pits but an electric altimeter would only work offshore or over a harbour. I knew it would simply fail in the valley. There were too many hills around. I'll give it a try, I promised, not intending to do anything. But the problem of altitude retention remained our vulnerability for a few more days. In the end, it was solved by a surprisingly simple method, but more on that later. By the end of the third week, all crews had made about 20 night flights and could find the tree I demanded to find. The navigators worked just fine. We dropped about 1,500 training bombs at the range and the average error was less than 25 yards. But with basic training completed, we could begin route selection. We needed to find as accurate a simulation as possible within England. This gave the boys a chance to practice breaking through enemy air defences. We had to send for Charles Picard, the famous F. Freddy pilot who knew better than anyone the location of enemy anti-aircraft guns in the coastal areas of Holland and Belgium. He took out of his safe a map on which all areas of the coast with strong air defence were shaded in red. He showed me how to plot a winding route that at no point would be closer than one mile to a gun. Then Charles Whitworth and I, with the help of the Group Chief of Staff, tried to depict the same route over England. This proved easier than we expected. The flight across the North Sea was depicted as a flight across the North Sea. Only halfway through did the airplane turn back and end up over England again. It crossed the coast over the wash, which resembled the Dutch islands. Then it would go from the junction of the canals to the railroad junction, thence over the canals to the automobile viaducts, because they were clearly visible in the moonlight. But each turning point was chosen to correspond to an actual point over German territory. If we had to turn over a particular bridge in Holland, we turned over a similar bridge in Norfolk. Instead of the River Rhine, we had the River Trent. The hills of the Rue represented the Cotswolds. Instead of Lake Myung, we used Uppingham Reservoir, which is very similar in shape to the German reservoir, though much smaller. Lake Colchester portrayed the calm waters of Eder Reservoir very well. It was all very, very similar. On the way home, we crossed the English coast at Norfolk over the same sand dunes that are near Hook of Holland. There was even the exact same windmill and radio station mast. Moreover, the distances were almost identical to the real ones, which was perfect. We knew this because we had flown the whole way ourselves and had seen for ourselves. After the training route had been practiced, 
I gave the maps to Jack Lego and ordered that all crews be trained to fly at blind. But why lakes? Are we going to be defined by lakes? That's right. I told you. Their reference points, I habitually lied. It's not hard to imagine how much the Germans would have paid to find out. If they had found out, the air defence of the dams would have been immediately reinforced. We knew, however, that the state of the defences remained the same as at the beginning of the year. Even the double anti-torpedo net was beginning to rust from old age. But we were taking the most stringent security measures. All phones were tapped. One guy called his girlfriend and said that he couldn't make it, because he was flying out in the evening for a special training session. The next day, in front of the squadron, I gave him a good beating, explaining that such talk could well end in court. There was no more unnecessary talk. Sentries were posted all around the airfield. Every person working at the base, man and woman, was read an instruction to maintain military secrecy. All our letters were perlustrated, and if the censor found even the slightest hint of an impending operation, the letter was returned. Special plainclothes policemen patrolled the neighbourhood. Their job was to eavesdrop. They did an excellent job. Someone said even one barmaid was exiled for three months. The same draconian measures were in effect everywhere, at the war plant, at the firing range, at the air ministry. If we recall what happened, we should recognise that all military and civilian persons willingly cooperated with us. They knew that they held 125 lives in their hands, and they kept quiet. So three weeks later, the prospects began to look brighter. Training and secrecy were in sync. The weather smiled on us, the planes flew themselves. The crews began to get used to flying at low altitude, and no one crashed. Pilots began practicing group flights at night at low altitude. Training bombing was characterized by a fairly high marksmanship. In reality, only two serious issues remained unresolved. The first, the weapon itself. The second, the retention of altitude. High morale distinguished our squadron, which was turning into a single unit. Adjutant wrote in the squadron diary on April 14. The entire 617th permeated with a sense of unity. Officers and enlisted men give themselves to their work with great enthusiasm, not only during flights, but also during the cleaning and clearing of hangars and facilities. I think we're starting to have a tradition. On April 15, with a month to go, the air group commander called. Bob Hay and I were to fly to Parkstone, a place on the south coast, not far from the French coast. That's where the first tests of the new weapon were to take place. We set about solving the first problem.